morning. What a privilege it is to be here with you this morning. Um, I have a confession to make. I am not a digital expert. I'm a primary school teacher um, who is, like most of our generation, constantly amazed by anything that appears on a computer. I still find iPhones extraordinary. I still find iPads amazing. I would, wouldn't, I mean, it always puzzled me how brilliant Steve Jobs and his team of creative people were. Can you imagine being in the meeting when Steve Jobs said, you know how new technology is about making everything smaller? Well, I've got an idea. Let's make an iPhone that's eight times bigger. <laughs> you would have loved to have been in those kind of meetings. So things like that still amaze me. I'm not a technology expert, I'm not an animator, I'm a teacher. And when I was asked to come and share with you my opinions on education and the impact of the digital revolution, I thought very deeply to myself about what that meant to me. And what I want to do in the hour that I have with you this morning is talk about something a little bit deeper. I want to talk about people. I want to talk about human beings. And I want to flip the challenge of my speech. Because I don't believe by any imagination that I could tell many of you about how to utilize technology in education because many of you would know more about it than I ever will. But what I want to do is I want to lay before us some of the great challenges I think our children face in their lives and will face in their future. And therefore, the challenges as educators that we face in redesigning and reconstructing the education system. And then, to use the lens of new technologies and digital media to think about how we can use those tools to help solve the problem. You see, for me, one of the great problems, one of the great fears I have about education over the last few years and the incredible, uh, the incredible evolution of what we understand about education. We understand so much more about the way the brain works, about how we learn. In the last 15 to 20 years, there's been a revolution in knowledge and understanding. And at the same time, there's been a revolution in digital technologies. But the, one of the great fears I have about the education system is we've spent 15 or 20 years talking about all of this stuff. But how much of it has truly transformed the way we educate young people? One of the things I see as I travel around the world is people grasping new ideas in education and implementing new strategies in our schools and our colleges and our universities. But they do this on top of everything else we already do. We don't use this stuff to catalyze, to transform the system. We just add this stuff on top of. And so for me, one of the great challenges of a conference like today is not just to be dazzled by the extraordinary potential of animation and digital media, but actually first to take a step back and say, rather than just using this as well as everything else we do, how can we use this knowledge, this experience, to transform the system we're developing? Because when you think about the last 15 years, the pressure that educators have been under has been extreme. Because we've always had to deliver what we've always had to deliver, and we've had to learn to use all of this new stuff as well. So this morning, I want us to take a step backwards because we have to move away from the model, the traditional model that says everything we do has to be to the same end point. We actually have to first ask, what is the purpose of education 
as we move into this next part of the 21st century. Let me illustrate my point in the best way. This is as good as my animation gets, by the way, okay? So at this point, you're going to realize I was possibly not the expert I was meant to be, right? I don't know how many of you have seen this. This made me laugh the first time I saw this. This is a fishing village, I believe, in Scotland. And what you will notice from this wonderful image is that a man has obviously reversed his car a little bit too hard and he's ended up stood on it in the water. Now, let me explain the scene to you. Up here, there is a good old-fashioned British pub filled with men. Now, I'm sure it's true in Denmark as it is in the UK. When there's a physical problem, men think it's their point to solve the problem. Men think physical problems are for them to solve. So what you'll see is a group of men have come out of the pub to solve this problem. And they have adopted man problem solving pose. <laughs> And what they found, which is very lucky, is a crane. And these men have said, we shall use the crane to raise the car from the water. And then we'll she, we shall go back to the pub and drink to our success. Right? So this is all going very, very nicely indeed. And as you can see as it moves on, Things are going brilliant. They're going so brilliantly that even more men have come out of the pub to claim that it was their idea in the first place. Have you noticed that with men? Men gather together when something good is happening and they all try to claim it was their idea. Right? So now we've got lots of men stood and they're no longer in problem-solving pose. They are now in problem solved pose. They're looking very proud of themselves. <laughs> Until this happens. <laughs> now what you will notice in this picture is that all the men have run away. <laughs> including the dog, who is a boy dog. He too now is running away. Now you see, this is a great paradigm of the world we were educated to live in. Because what we were taught in life was if something isn't working, it's because we're not trying hard enough. If you think about the education system around the world, and you listen to some of the politics that's going on in education around the world at the moment, people are recognizing that the system isn't working. But what we keep being told is it's because we're not working hard enough. We're not getting our children through exams well enough. We're not doing the traditional things well enough. So the pressure that educators are under and the reason why we keep grasping at new ideas and putting them on top of everything else we already do is because we think we have to try harder, work harder, do more to get children through the systems we've always got children through. And what then happens in the village in Scotland when you think that way is that the only reason that didn't work was because we didn't have a big enough crane. <laughs> now please notice, the men are back. <laughs> because everything's working again. Right? I don't need to show you the last slide, do I? You know what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
I think that's how education has felt over the last 20 years. It's not working, we need a bigger crane, right? And what's going to happen is people under pressure come to events like this where extraordinary things are shared and then they go back to the day job, back in their classrooms when you go back to work tomorrow and all the pressures are there. And then you're thinking to yourself, how do I put this on top of everything else I'm doing? So let's make today a day where we take a step backwards. Let's make today a day where, as well as celebrating the possibilities that animation and digital media can offer us in terms of transforming our education system for our children, let's spend today taking that step back and asking the deep questions about what we need to do to transform the education system and how new media and digital technology can help us. You see, I think we're living, isn't that a lovely symbol? That's the international symbol of empowerment. Not a lovely symbol. You see, I think this is the greatest. I was talking last night to some friends over dinner. But if we take that step back and we think about the world our children will be inheriting from us. I think we have done a really bad job in developing a legacy for our children. Potentially one of the worst legacies any generation is handing down to its next generation. If you think about the global challenges that our children will be inheriting from us, there are at least three great crises which threaten the world we live on today. We have the economic crisis. And actually, the economic crisis is only partly because of the crash that occurred in 2007, 2008. The truth is, the economic models around the world simply cannot sustain the number of people on the planet. There is not enough money and the structures and systems around money simply are not sustainable for the number of people on our planet. And when you think at the speed at which the global population is growing, that's only going to get worse. The second great crisis, of course, is the crisis of environment. Like the economy, we cannot continue to burn the world up at the rate we are because it will be impossible for the planet to sustain itself. And the third great crisis that I see is around the growing divide between socio-ethnic groups around the world. Now when you think about those as the gifts that we are bestowing on our children, that's terrifying. But what that says to me is that we can't continue to educate our children the way we were educated. We have to develop a generation who think radically differently to us. Because that generation, our children's generation, the generation of young people who are in school now, are the generation who are going to have to find the solutions to those problems. Because if they don't, I'm not sure that their children or their children's children will have a planet to live on. So we have to educate our children radically differently. Now the reason I put this symbol up here is because of the traditional model of education, and I'll talk about this in a minute, is based on the notion of control. What we mass education has done is taught our children to fit certain roles in life. And the education systems have been designed to help them be in the right roles in life. Traditional teaching has always been about the teacher as the keeper of knowledge, bestowing that knowledge to young people in a level of control, just the right amount of information at the right time in the right way. What we've taught children 
is to learn from us, from teachers. When, of course, the greatest irony about children is that they are born learning machines. Where they don't need to be taught how to learn, do they? If you think about it, experts will tell us that they learn somewhere between 75 to 80 percent of everything they learn in their lifetime before they're five years old. Interesting, because what happens around the time they're five years old? So we have to make sure our education system is a system of empowerment, not control. It's a system where we understand and respect that actually if we nurtured our children's natural, natural ability as learners, wouldn't it be amazing what they could become? So let me start here by sharing with you something that's very personal to me, which is my personal mantra for what I believe education should be. As a teacher and as a head teacher, I lived my life professionally through three words. A guarantee to the children that I had the privilege of working with. Because to me, education has become too complicated. We have tried to become too clever. We have tried to dig too deep. When actually I believe education is a fundamentally simple process that has been overcomplicated by politicians and intellectuals and academics. Because to me education is nothing more than a series of human interactions. It's about emotional connections. And so I would ask, how can we use digital media, new technology, animation to reconnect to those principles? The principles of narrative, of emotional connection, of storytelling. So here are my three words. First and foremost, I believe education is about a celebration of life as it is and as it could be. That our job as educators is to help our children celebrate the potential for living their lives. For how magical learning can be as part of that process. But actually it should be a celebration of what our children individually and collectively can achieve. And how much of our education system is built around that simple principle. And let me give you an example of what I mean. I remember at the turn of the millennium reading an extraordinary book called The School I'd Like, written by two professors of education in the UK, Catherine Burke and Ian Grosvenor. And what they did at the turn of the millennium was they travelled around the UK talking to young people between the ages of 3 and 18. And they asked them one simple question. What would your ideal school be like? And the book is filled with incredible quotes and insights from young people about what makes a great school. It's a book I urge every teacher in the world to read. Because for me it was a transformative, provocative book. But there is one quote in particular that I remember reading that I found particularly difficult. And actually I found it a bit like a punch in the stomach when I first read it. It came from a young woman whose name is Kirsty, who at the time of the interview was 16 years old. And I knew the area she lived in, so I knew she didn't come from a comfortable middle class family. She was from a socially deprived community in the middle of the UK. And she was asked the question, what would your ideal school be like? And this is what she said in reply. She said, in my ideal school, we will no longer be treated like a herd of an identical wild animal waiting to be civilized for the outside world. You will realize and respect that it's my world too. 
Now, I don't know about you, but every time I think about that quote, it punches me here because it makes me think about the way we manage and run our schools and our classrooms. And I understand exactly what she means. But more than that, when I became a head teacher, I remember using that quote as a stimulus for conversation with my staff, which was always around the critical response to a question, which was, how much of what we do in this school do we do because it's the way the adults like it? And how much of what we do in our school do we do because it's what's right for children? And I think one of the great challenges when we try to engage our colleagues, because let's face it, the wonderful educators in this room, none of you need persuading that digital media has power in education. But my guess is there are a number of your colleagues back in your schools who frankly will use any excuse they can not to get involved in new media and digital technologies because it scares them. So one of the great challenges, I think, when we're referring to the digital revolution and the impact it has on our education system is to make sure that our colleagues can't dismiss it because they don't understand it. And actually, if what we want is for our children to develop more creative, more innovative, more entrepreneurial mindsets, then we have to expect our teachers to do the same first. And we can't allow digital media, which is so important in life in the 21st century, to sit on the outside of education because we have a generation of teachers who are terrified by not understanding what it is. And of course, the great joy for me as an educator around digital media, and I found it very freeing, was the understanding that it wasn't my job always to educate, but sometimes to be educated. And of course, some, you will all know that the greatest moments in our classrooms occur when it's the children who feel they're in control of the learning. And I think we need to ask ourselves questions of how we use new technologies in that way to change the paradigm so that our children become the teachers, so that our children start to take control of the learning process and we become models of learning. And I think it's one of the important messages is to get across to our teaching colleagues that it is okay not to know. It is okay to be the learner. And actually some of the most powerful classrooms I've ever visited, some of the most powerful classrooms I've ever been in, have been classrooms where the children are controlling and driving the learning forwards and the teachers are on the receiving end of that learning. Which brings me on to my second word, which is learning. Now again for me, one of the great concerns I have about traditional education is that for many of our children, Learning is an abstract concept. When they go to school, you ask most children why they go to school, particularly as they get older, and they say things like, to learn the syllabus, to pass my exams, to go on to the next stage. And isn't that sad? That the most magical times of our lives, our childhoods, the times when we are at our most powerful as learners, when we have our most powerful dreams, when our lives are ahead of us, when the ambitions we may have are all there for the taking. What our children perceive is that virtually all of their waking hours are spent preparing for something else. And there's a wonderful quote from an incredible old American educator. I wonder how many of you have come across him one of the world's first truly brilliant alternative educators, a man called John Holt. And when John Holt was retiring, his wife was looking to buy him a retirement gift because he'd been so busy teaching all his life, he'd never had time for hobbies. My guess is many of you know how that feels. And you build a list of all the things you wish you'd had time to do and you think when you retire you'll do them then. And he had a list. And at the top of his list was a, a regret too. He'd always regretted that he'd never learnt to play a musical instrument. 
And the musical instrument in particular that he'd always wanted to play was the cello. So his wife, as a surprise, on his retirement, bought him a set of cello lessons. So he began to learn to play the cello. And he was loving it. And after a few cello lessons, his music teacher said, John, let's have a chat about how we think it's going. And, and so the music teacher was talking a lot about what she thought about John as a student, as a potential musician. She was very positive. And then she said to John, have you got any questions you'd like to ask me? And he said, just one. He said, for weeks now, I've been telling my friends that I'm learning to play the cello. He said, when can I tell them I'm playing the cello. Now, for me, that's a very powerful comment about education. And one of the great powers for me of digital media, and particularly of animation, is the immediacy of the education experience. It immediately puts into the controlled hands of young people genuine power to communicate, to interact, to emotionally engage in something that isn't just about something that might be worthwhile for them in five or ten years' time. But it's in the magic of the moment. It's in the creation of a product that they can share and celebrate for the now, not just for something they do tomorrow. I had an experience, not with animation, but I, an experience I want to tell you about, which I found very powerful just three weeks ago. I was invited to speak at an education conference in Medellin, in Colombia. And I don't know how many of you know, but Medellin, of course, is famous for one thing. Pablo Escobar, the great drug lord, right? Who, frankly, thankfully, was gotten rid of uh, a few years ago now. But he left Medellin as one of the most dangerous cities in the world. Fragmented, incredible levels of poverty. And Medellin today is looking to reinvent itself as a technological and cultural hub for Colombia. But very cleverly, it's realized that it can't, it can't sell itself outwards until it's reinvented the way people living in Medellin feel about the city. And it's using education as a very powerful tool to do this. I went into a school way up in the hills, which of course in cities like Medellin is where the most socially deprived communities live. Way up in the hills, in what was nothing more than a hut made of corrugated steel and a little bit of concrete. And this school in this community had just taken uh, in, thanks to a couple of major organizations, had just taken in some amazing new technological equipment, some laptops, high-speed internet access. And I went into a class of 14-year-old children. And I was walking around the class, and the lesson they were having, and by the way, this was one of the first uh, times these children had attended school. Most of these young people had never seen a need. To them, school was irrelevant, because education didn't mean anything, because they were never going to achieve. So they put these computers, fantastic pieces of equipment in this room. They trained some amazing young teachers, and these 14-year-olds now had been going to school for a few weeks because they had been invited in to use the computers to create websites. So the first job of the teachers was to teach the children how to create a website. And then they said to them, and now you know how to create a website, we want you to design websites in things that you think are important. Because immediately we, what we want to show you is that by engaging in education, it can transform your life. You can become more active. You can communicate with the world about the things that interest you, that bother you, that concern you. And what they were doing, of course, was teaching these students that education was an incredible tool of empowerment. So these young people started to design their websites. Now, I don't know 
If you said to a group of Danish teenagers, create a website, I wonder what the content would be for most Danish teenagers. I know what it would be in the UK. It would be football stars, pop stars, movie stars, fashion. These would be the things that young teenagers in the UK would want to communicate about. I was deeply affected when I walked around the room, the, the classroom. Because I went up to one young woman, a 14-year-old girl, and she was designing a website about teenage sexual abuse. And then I went to another teenager, a young boy, who was designing a website about surviving life with a drug addict parent. And then I went to another, and another one was talking about teenage abortion. And another, and another was talking about youth mental health. These were the issues that were affecting these young people. But for the first time in their lives, they had found somewhere that taught them how to communicate the things that mattered to them. And as a result, these young people saw immediately the value of education. And that's why they were turning up every hour of every day. And they wanted to become increasingly literate. And they wanted to become increasingly numerate. Because they could see by doing so how education could help transform their lives and their own personal sense of value. So again, what I would ask you, and it's not as such an extreme level here clearly, how do we use digital media and media like animation as tools of empowerment? How do we use it as the point of connection for our youngest students in our schools to feel that they can communicate the things that matter to them? Because I think that new technology can be the catalyst to redefining the way our children perceive education. It can be used, I mean, let's be honest, our children use it at home in their personal lives as a tool of empowerment and communication. And unless we validate that experience by using exactly the same methodology in a school, I wonder actually for how many generations school is going to be relevant anymore. I wonder how many children will stop going to school because actually they'll realise all the traditional things they learn in school they can learn in five minutes on a Google search. How are we going to reinvent the experience? And the final word up here isn't a clever one. I don't have a clever story. But one of the other things that concerns me, we know that education is the most important gift a civilised society can bestow on its children. We know this. But why do we have to take it so seriously all of the time? Shouldn't education be fun? Shouldn't it be magical? Shouldn't it be exciting? Shouldn't we want our children to queue up every day to come back into our schools? I remember when I first became a head teacher and I took on a school that the United Kingdom government was going to shut down. Pardon me, it was so bad they were going to shut this school down. And I remember walking in on my first day. It was, by the way, the reason I was given the job, because nobody else wanted it. Right? I, honestly, it's the only reason I became a head teacher. Um, I went in to fix the photocopier machine, and they were glad there was a body. I became the head teacher. But I, I went into this school, and everybody was expecting me to talk to them about academic standards, because Everyone had talked to them about academic standards for eight years. And I knew what all great educators know. That education standards are not what you focus on if you're going to be a great teacher. It's engagement. It's excitement. It's dynamic. Education must be a rich in context and experience. And it must be fun. So at my first meeting... I walked into the staff room and there were 200 staff sat in the room and they didn't look as happy as you do. In fact, they were miserable. And most of them, I think, were looking at me thinking, 
I bet this man doesn't last more than two weeks in our school. And I immediately said something, and I think they thought I was mad. Because I walked into their school on the first day. They'd been failing for eight years. They'd had seven head teachers in ten years. They were used to chewing up head teachers and getting rid of them, right? And in my first meeting, instead of talking about exam results and standards and outcomes, I asked them a very simple question. I stood there and I said to them, how do we turn our school into Disneyland? <laughs> and I got the same reaction that you just gave me then. They laughed at me. But my point was a serious one. Because if any of you have been to Disneyland, what do you see? Who are the people who complain at Disneyland? It's not the children, it's the adults. Children will queue for an hour to go on a ride that lasts two minutes. When they come off the ride, what's the first thing the children say? Please, can we go again? And it's the adults who are going, no! <laughs> right? What is it that they do that creates an environment where children want to be so much? That engagement, the immediacy, the excitement, the emotional connection. And again, the question I'd ask of digital media and of animation is how do we use those concepts, not just with our older students, but with our youngest students, to find a way to make education matter at a deeper level? How do we create an education system that empowers, that develops individuality, that develops creativity and self-expression, that teaches our children that education is about empowerment? It's about developing the skills of entrepreneurship and enterprise and the ability to question and challenge and make things happen. You see, the really scary thing right now is we're having this conversation and there are places around the world that are already dramatically transforming their education systems. And it's why for me, it's time that we stop talking and what's wonderful about this conference is going to be the celebration of the things that are happening right now. And how all of us as delegates can take some of that stuff that's happening right now. I want to give you an example of why I feel so challenged. So I've been working with a number of organisations, interestingly not always in education. So I've been working with companies like Google. And the interesting thing about my work with Google is I can't teach them anything about new technology, but what I do is talk to them about developing human capacity. Because that's what educators are experts in. We're experts in human capacity. And one of the other groups I've been talking to is Z. How many of you have heard of Z Media? Z Media are the world's biggest media company. They have a bigger audience reach than any other media company on earth. And it's because they're based in India. They own most of Bollywood and they run most of the Indian Asian television networks. Their audience reach is spectacular. A number of years ago, Z engaged in a very dramatic expansion plan. They want to continue to drive uh, Z's profile both through the Asian markets and eventually into the Western markets. If you look, they're already starting because the rise of interest in Bollywood, for example, now in Europe and the West is quite dramatic. And this is very strategic. And at the heart of this is Z. And what they also are is fiercely patriotic. Z see themselves as a company who can truly generate wealth for the Indian nation. So they always look to employ young Indians as part of their organisational development. But what they realised about five years ago was the education system in India was not developing young people in the way Z needed them to be developed to work in that forward-thinking organisation. An Indian education system is based very much on the traditional Western education system. 
So Z started to do something that only the very richest corporations can do. They decided to start to invent and create their own schools. In the first two years, Z opened 125 schools in India. In the next five to six years, they plan to open another five to six hundred schools. And when I was asked to start to work with them, they sent me their vision statement, their raison d'etre. And I want to read to you the first paragraph, because this for me lays down the challenge that we need to respond to right now. It says, for India to achieve its target of double digit GDP growth. I don't know what the GDP figure is in Denmark at the moment, but in the UK, we've just had a party because it's gone above 0.5%. It needs to harness all of its resources. The, the biggest one being our manpower. Sadly, our manpower today is not equipped to take on the challenge of leading India to its destiny. 35% of them are illiterate. And the ones who are certified literate are barely employable. This is because their curiosity to learn and discover their unique potential is dulled and stamped out by our rote learning and testing approach. Everybody has to learn the same way, is tested the same way, and there is no accommodation for each child's uniqueness. Now, I don't know about you, but I would suggest that is one heck of a challenge for us. Because if India are beginning to understand that the traditional education system is actually resulting in a generation of young people who simply aren't competitive, and therefore they are redesigning their entire education system around innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, and immediacy of communication, then I would suggest conferences like today take on increasing levels of importance. I've only got about 10 minutes left, so if it's all right, I'm going to keep on with this theme and then finish. I'm going to dart through some slides and finish with a, a final thought about creativity. I hope that's okay for people. And then there'll be time for you to ask me a few questions or punch me or something. I don't mind, really. <laughs> the problem we have with the way we think and behave in the West is dominated actually by this man. I'm blaming him today. It's always nice, isn't it, to blame somebody for the problem. So I've decided we'll blame him. We're not going to blame the financial sector today or banks or greed. We're going to blame him. And I'm going to blame him because he's not alive anymore. So he can't defend himself, which is always good, I think. This man is a man called Frederick Wilmslow Taylor. Frederick Wilmslow Taylor is the father of modern industrialism as we know it. He wrote a paper at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, called The Science of Productivity. The Science of Productivity became the model by which 20th century business was operated, and as a result, the way mass education was created. The science of productivity was founded on a very, very simple principle. It was this, that companies produce a set product or have a set service. And actually to maximise your profit as an industrial organisation, you have to work on efficiency. So the model was this, focus on efficiency to increase productivity. Increase productivity, increase profitability. And so you create the perfect industrial cycle. Our education system was rightly at the time designed to ensure that everyone coming through the system thought that way. And if you think about mass education as a model, that's exactly how it's designed. Teach children to become more and more efficient at doing the same stuff. So when they're measured, they become better. And therefore, they get better exam results, 
and therefore they become better at that process. So when they then go into the workplace, they can get behind their desk or behind a machine in a factory and understand the methodology of efficiency, the science of productivity. It became known better in Western Europe as time and motion. And so the model was developed. And that today is the way we were educated to think. And actually, to an extent, it's the way our children are educated to think. But of course, the truth is, we're no longer living in an industrial age, as the growth and explosion of digital media and animation shows us. The world now is about who can create stuff that's new fastest. Who can invent new things? Let me show you why this matters so much. I apologize, I didn't put Denmark on this list. I wonder how many of you have ever seen the Global Entrepreneurship and Development Index. It's a fascinating index, research, that's done every year. And it amazes me because most of the governments I talk to never use this index as a driver for national policy. They should. Gedi, every year, produce a list, a ranked list, of participating nations in terms of what percentage of their national economy is based on new business and innovation, right? I've scrambled the list up. They're not in the right order. But I've picked out some nations that are on that list. At the moment, there are 79 participating nations every year. Just for a minute, turn to the person next to you and see if you can agree which of those nations might appear in the top three, the most innovative countries in the world, and the bottom three. You ready? Go. Okay then. Anyone brave enough to shout out a country that they think is in the top three? Remember, I'm a teacher, so if you're wrong, I'll be very nice. <laughs> Pardon? Uganda. Stupid girl. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Uganda. Thank you. India. India. Japan. Japan. Brazil. Brazil. Stop. I know what you're doing now. You're clever, you Danes, aren't you? You think if you tell me every country on the list, you'll look right, okay? <laughs> Stop. Let me show you. This is going to interest some of you. So what I've got on the next slide is I've put them in order from the most innovative to the least innovative and in brackets where they come in the total list of 79. Have a look at this. You ready? That's interesting, isn't it? Very interesting. What's really interesting is the BRIC countries are down at the bottom. Why? Because they're in the middle of their industrial age. They're living the world of Frederick Wilmslow Taylor. They're not moving beyond that yet. They're still in industrialism, which says we have to be working harder at developing the next phase of our economic development, which relies on innovation, creativity and entrepreneurship. And when you look at the countries on that list, it also fascinates me. America at the top, and with, with respect to any Americans in the audience, we'll ignore them because they always cheat. Okay? No, we won't. But when you think about America, you think about where that massive chunk of their economy comes from because in many ways they're still quite a tradi traditional nation. But it comes from the fact that they own Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Google, they're all American companies, all new tech businesses. It's the new tech industry that's actually keeping the American economy afloat at the moment. Massive percentage. Then you look at the next two. They don't surprise me at all. Did you know that uh, in September a global research paper came out to say that Sweden, per head, uses the internet more than any other nation on earth? <coughs> Now, I don't know about you, but I would suggest there was a link, wouldn't you? Australia has one of the most three-dimensional education systems on Earth. Australia has one of the most powerful systems around the development of the whole child and the individual. No accident. Then you look at Western Europe, which is somewhere in the middle, because we still don't know what we are. We don't know whether we're supposed to be innovative or industrial. 
And at the moment, that dialogue is continuing. But what we do know is we want to be at that end of the table, not that end of the table. And the interesting thing when you look at education policy at the moment around the world is it is obsessed with what these countries are doing. Why? We shouldn't be doing what they're doing. We should be asking what they're doing. And we should be making sure that we compete on the same level. I'm going to fly right the way through. This would have been interesting. You'll have to have me back sometime. <laughs> that would have been interesting. Uh, oh, that, I've told you that story. Let me go to this bit. Let me finish here. Where does creativity go? This is one of the things I get asked a lot by people. And one of the things that worries me most is this idea that creativity is the answer. And so what I find when I travel around the world at the moment talking to education communities, they all want to know how to teach creativity. It's one of the most common questions I get asked. But Richard, how do we teach creativity? Like it's some mystical process. Like we can do it through a lesson plan. Like we can put together a curriculum to teach creativity. I've got a confession to make. You know, I'm supposed to be Sir Ken Robinson's new uh, right-hand man. You know, he's meant to be my mentor. I'm meant to be the new baby Ken Robinson, right? I know, I hope, I wish, please, thank you. Um, but Ken is my mentor, my professional dad, and we talk about this an awful lot. Because one of the things that really irritates me is creativity is not something you can teach. It's a ridiculous notion. You can't teach creativity. It's not a commodity. It's not the sort of thing you'd find on a stock exchange. <coughs> Let's buy into creativity. It's very groovy right now. Everybody's talking about it. You know, I get asked to go and talk to companies like Morgan Stanley, the bank. And they say, Richard, teach our management team to be creative. Like you can just like Tinkerbell dispensing fairy dust. <laughs> but here's what I do believe. You know, because to me... Creativity is a fundamental part of human intelligence. It goes back to something I said earlier. We're born creative, every single one of us. That's why we learn so much in the first five years of our lives. We're born curious, creative, extraordinary beings who know no boundaries. When we're first born, what do we spend those first few years of our lives doing? shuffling around, picking up anything we can find, sticking it in our mouths, sticking it in our parents' ears. We do stuff all the time. We learn to walk and talk, make sense of the world around us. We start to learn about smell and sound and touch and all of those things. We learn vocal intonation. We learn body language. And we learn all of those things before anybody teaches us how to do them. Because we're born creative. You see, for me, creativity and learning at its basic level are the same thing. Creativity, like learning, is the ability to find something of interest. To have the confidence to play with that concept, that idea, that physical object. To hypothesize, to investigate and as a result of that process, to discover something new, something you can do differently, something you can utilize that product or that idea or that concept for in a new way. That, to me, is the creative process. We're born that way. So where does it go? Let me show you some famous images. I'm sure many of you have seen them before. I love using these as an example of where it goes. I often show that image to big corporate audiences of adults and I ask them what it is. And I don't know if you've seen it before, but it comes from that wonderful book, Earth from the Air. If you haven't got a copy and you're a, an educator in school, get a copy. And use every image like this as a discussion point with your students. So I often ask an adult audience, what is it? Now, the really interesting thing is, as adults, we have been taught by the education system that excellence comes from getting things right. It's what we teach our children from the earliest stages of formal education. You show how clever you are by getting things right. And we teach them that logic is the currency of success. 
The more logical you are, the cleverer you are, the more successful you'll be. That's the traditional mindset. So when you show that to an audience, they immediately start piecing together the logic. So they're saying blue, water, brown, land, green, pollution, algae, hold on. I think it might be sulphur. And I definitely now think it's sulphur because that looks like a larval flow. And that looks like a hot spring. And I think this might be somewhere volcanic. And then the really clever people who did really well in geography at school sit there with, you know, like kids do. I know the answer. And they put their hands up and they go, that, I think you'll find, is Yellowstone National Park in the United States of America. And you look at them and you think, you're right, but you're sad. When you ask that same question to a group of six-year-old children, my favourite response came from a group of six-year-olds who said, that is the face of an evil witch. <laughs> I know some of you now are still going, I can't see that myself, but it doesn't matter. The point is, children, young children are not yet taught to look for the right answer. They look to dive in and immerse themselves in the possibilities of what it could be. Because then you take it on to the next level. And you say to those children, what's the story behind the picture? So we've had a conversation, right, about it being a wizard or a witch. And they've got this in their heads. And then they turn it into a story. You ask adults and they run away. What's the story? They disappear. You ask, I'm not going to do it to you, but you ask the children, same six-year-old children, but tell me the story behind the picture. And within five minutes, one group of six-year-olds came up with this. Five minutes. They said, what's happening in that photograph is that there's an evil wizard up in the top corner, but you can't see them. They're not in the picture. And the evil wizard is sucking all of the colour out of the earth. And the people on the bridge are brave soldiers. And it's their job to stop the world from becoming black and white. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I'm like, wow. Hey, aren't you? So there's the question. Where does that go? What happens here? Let me give you another very quick example. For those that need the right answer, that is date drying in the Cairo Basin. My favourite response from a group of seven-year-old children, that group of people are building a duvet for a giant. <laughs> And here's where I'm going to finish, because I know I've run out of time. Where does it go? And here's the biggest challenge I want to lay before you as a group of educators today, and particularly in relation to how new media, the digital revolution and animation can help solve this problem. Because solve this problem, we find the key to the answers to all of the challenges I've laid before you this morning. How do we reconfigure the notion of risk? How do we reconfigure the notion of what it means to fail and to make a mistake? Because as I've just said, education teaches us wrongly that making mistakes are bad. We get rewarded when we get things right. So as we get older, we, we avoid more and more the things we think we'll get wrong. We avoid more and more the things we don't think we understand. We avoid more and more the situations we're not comfortable in. And as we get older, like the iris in an eye, under too much light, we close down. And we limit our lives to the things we can control. Now, in an industrial age, that was okay. <laughs> in a world that is riddled with profound uncertainty, where there is no certain future, there are no definite pathways, where children who are, are going to have to leave education and be capable of creating their own work, 
finding their own futures, solving the problems of environment, economy and socio-ethnic strife. They are going to have to be naturally creative. They are going to have to be ultimate learners. And if I've learnt nothing else in my time as an educator, I've learnt this. You learn nothing new by getting something right. You only ever learn something new from the point of a mistake or the realisation that you don't know something or that you can't do something. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you. No, I'm not. I um. Yeah, the school still. Yeah, the school is still standing. Some people would say it's still standing because I'm not there anymore. Um, but no, it is. And uh, I didn't leave. You know, a lot of people ask me this question in all seriousness. I didn't leave because I was fed up or stressed. I left because this new world opened up to me, and I thought after all these years of telling other people to take a risk. I should take one. So I decided to have one great adventure in my life. But the school is still going and it's still working. And it's still working because basically it's run by the children. It's a bit scary. Thank you for being here. That's pleasure. So, thank you. So, so, so we do have a Disneyland in England. We didn't know that. Oh, there is a Disneyland in Derbyshire. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, would like, I would like to ask, when you had that, that list with the United States uh -huh. on top being innovative and... and uh, what is it that they can do in the United States? We know that they are very good at invading countries. It's what's going on afterwards. Yeah, problem, it's very right? true. So, so, so what is it that they have found out? How, how are they able to be so good at innovation? I think what it is, when you look at America, genuinely, it's a very interesting case because it's a very small group of people that generate, are currently generating a massive potent, uh, percentage of that innovation. As a country itself, it's not inherently over-creative. Um, it is a country where entrepreneurship was born, really. And I think partly it's because it's such a young country. You know, it's a very young country. But when it first had to make its mark, it was all about new business creation, all about entrepreneurship. And now, don't, I'm not putting a moral judgment on this. But the other thing that I think it does well today but only in very small, because America is a very interesting case. On the whole, America is possibly the most conservative education nation in the world today, right? But there is a pocket, particularly of in higher education, of phenomenally innovative environments. You know, last night we were talking about one, which is MIT, MIT which I believe this year in the survey of universities, for the first time, MIT was named as the most successful university in the world this year. Well, you can imagine how that went down in England with Oxford and Cambridge, right? But if you look at places like MIT and Harvard, they have very well established, very powerful creative and innovation hubs. Really extraordinary. Because if, 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 if you take a top 50 European companies on the stock exchange, most of them are old, more than 50 years. And if you do the same thing in the United exactly. States, most of them are Exactly, exactly right. And so the main reason is because of its youth. Right. But I do think what is happening in America is everybody else is beginning to overtake them. You know, because they, they establish this, this spirit of innovation and enterprise, and then they're kind of locking it down. And I think they're in denial, actually, at the moment. Do we have a... Yeah, we have one here. Yes, one last one there. Thank you for the great conference. 
I, I remember that uh, I discovered in, in Brazil there is a schoolgirl who has a, 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 her own Facebook page. It's called Diario de Clase. It's like a, a classroom diary where she uh, daily uploads what happens in school. So it's a really interesting case of how children are being empowered by, by social media. She, she was uh, posting how uh, some uh, students were uh, fighting with the teacher and like crazy things. And all the whole country is, is being uh, aware of, of this problem, you know? And, yeah. and it was really interesting. There's a, there's a case very similar that's become very famous in the UK where a young girl of nine years of age was appalled at the food she was getting served in school. Her school lunches were awful. And every, she set up a blog, and every day she took a photograph of her school dinner, and she put it on the blog, and then she wrote about how awful the food was. It was really interesting because it started to get a lot of you know, local interest, but then the head teacher told her she had to shut down her blog. And the minute the head teacher did that, it became a national story, right? <laughs> Which is really interesting. Now her blog has hundreds of thousands of followers because she was the, 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 the public opinion forced the head teacher to allow her to keep it open, and it's made a massive difference. So you're absolutely right. You know, there are students out there who are going to change the system whether we like it or not. So we better just jump on board quickly. Thank you, Richard. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much.